Uh, Senator, you spent over four hours this past Sunday with the president of Mexico. Why? I went down there with a bipartisan, bicameral uh, congressional delegation, uh, Democrats and Republicans from the House and from the Senate. Went down to meet with him to talk about a lot of issues confronting both of our countries. We talked about everything from trade to trade relations with China and how that might affect our trade relationship with Mexico. We obviously talked about drug cartels, human trafficking, uh, migration, uh, illegal immigration coming into Mexico and into our country, and uh, a whole host of other related, uh, other issues one way or another related to those things. So uh, we covered a wide range of topics in those four to four and a half hours, and it was fantastic. We got to meet with him, and he brought in his core team, not his entire cabinet, but his uh, a subgroup within his cabinet, his most trusted advisors. We had very good conversations about various common challenges that we've got to address. In your capacity as United States Senator, you have on many occasions, I'm sure, interacted with various heads of state. Have you ever spent this much time, this much concentrated time with a, a single head of state? No, never in one setting. Um, uh, so this was unusual, but the fact that he was willing to do this and that he was willing on a weekend to bring in uh, his most trusted cabinet members, and then devote that much time and attention to every facet of what we were there discussing, uh, really says something uh, about him and about his team and about uh, the importance that he attaches to having a strong U.S.-Mexico relationship. You mentioned that this trip, this, uh, this congressional delegation which traveled to Mexico was bicameral and bipartisan. Is that typical? Um, it, it is not unusual at all to have a bipartisanship or, or of one sort or another on a congressional delegation. Uh, they're not all bipartisan. Many of them are. Uh, many of them aren't. What was unusual about this one is that we had people from both houses, from both chambers, Democrats and Republicans from the House and from the Senate, all represented, I think there were 12 uh, members of Congress in total. And so uh, we were fairly representative of the ideological spectrum in both chambers. During, during this visit, you led uh, a conversation regarding trade and how trade between the U.S. and Mexico can serve as a check against the ever-expanding power and influence of China. Uh, what did you say to your colleagues uh, from both sides of the southern border, and how was it received? The two countries have a whole lot more in common than either country has with, say, China. So, uh, it, and we also have a shared concern um, in the United States, uh, as they have in Mexico, with regard to becoming overly dependent on China, which uh, sometimes is a troubling trade partner, uh, to put it mildly. So I made the pitch that it's in both of our interests to make sure that we maintain free trade in both countries. Uh, the, the trade relationship, in my view, um, between the United States and Mexico, we enhanced the level of free trade that we had had previous to that uh, under NAFTA, with the passage of USMCA, the current trade agreement involving the US, Canada, and Mexico. I explained to them, I, I think the free trade that we enjoy under USMCA should be viewed as the floor rather than the ceiling of free trade. And I raised it because in just three years time, USMCA is gonna come up for reconsideration, either to extend it, to modify it, or to abandon it. And I, I want us to have the shared vision, the shared goal of treating the free trade available under USMCA as the floor. We build on it from that. We expand the free trade that we have in so many areas into other areas where it's less free than it should be. Lots of reasons for that, including and especially the fact this is our best shot at helping both countries avoid falling into the sometimes predatory traps of China. You, sir, you speak Spanish. You yes. speak Spanish very well. You learned the language while serving as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. During a portion of your remarks to the group, you you leaned on that language. And, oh, yeah. And, and, and described uh, a, similar, a similar symbol for both of our countries, Mexico and the United States, the eagle. Could you tell that story? I wanted to wrap it up with, with a message that would be uh, memorable, uh, that would be on point and... Uh, a little different so they'd remember it. So I, I tied in some images from both countries. Let me give it to you in Spanish first, and, uh, and then I'll translate it into English. I, I said, los dos 
países van a tener más éxito cuando el águila sobre el nopal puede volar con el águila pelón. Los dos águilas pueden volar con más altitud, con más velocidad y más poder cuando están juntos. Y it's referring to the symbols of both countries. The águila pelón represents the, the bald eagle, represented the United States. Uh, Aguila sobre el nopal is their national symbol, uh, emblazoned on their flag. And, and, I, and I said that when the two of them can fly together, we'll both be better off because uh, the bald eagle and the eagle over the cactus uh, will fly higher and uh, faster and with greater strength and power than either could fly alone. It seemed to work. He seemed to like it. He smiled, and it even got some applause. Outstanding. The uh, changing subjects here, sir, the, the evils of fentanyl and the cartel criminality that are killing Americans. 110,000 Americans last year. Record numbers. Were, were these topics discussed amongst your colleagues and your counterparts in Mexico during this trip? At immense length, yes. Uh, we discussed them at great length talking about the origins of the problem, talking about the choke points, uh, where the materials are coming in, where things are being mixed, processed, and ultimately converted into drugs that often end up in the United States. We talked about um, the, the loopholes legally and logistically that the traffickers are using and where we can close those off. Um, uh, Both on the Mexican side and on the U.S. side, we talked about things that both of us can do better and things that we hope the other will be able to accomplish that can make it better. It's a very difficult problem. I, I, it's, it's easy to start to oversimplify this, and so I'm not going to do that here. Um, but there are things we can do uh, to push back. It, it, but it is a, an immense problem. Uh, it's a problem of great urgency. And it's a problem that, while I and most of my colleagues have been terribly frustrated uh, by what we perceive to be the lack of action on the part of the Mexican government, in many instances a, a, um, a pattern, in some instances of lack of action, I do see a, a genuine commitment on the, pres on the part of President Lopez Obrador um, to address this. And one of the reasons why I think that separate and apart from his expression of uh, strong desire to get tougher on these issues, is the fact that this is starting to affect the Mexican population in a way that it hasn't in the past. In the past, these Mexican drug cartels um, were selling their drugs mostly to Americans, or all, at times almost entirely to Americans. It's not that they weren't doing any business in Mexico, at the retail level. It's just that it was a very, very small part of it. But with the rise of fentanyl, fentanyl which can be produced less expensively, more quickly, um, and, and isn't subject to a growing season, um, this stuff is now making it onto the streets uh, uh, at, at the retail level. And it's not just Americans who are dying from it anymore. It's, it's also Mexican citizens. It's not that he didn't care about what it was doing before that, but I do think it brings urgency to the problem that's going to uh, bring, I hope, some favorable results. Senator, thank you. Thank you.